As every as you all know, I'm here every week, so you don't need to. I don't need to do my thing. But we're here with Dr. Jen Simmons, and Dr. Simmons, I will let you pretty much uh, take the reins. Dr. Keneally will be up in a minute, okay. and uh, you know, do your intro. Let everybody know. I mean, there we're, we have a treat. It's definitely a treat. I was. I know. I have. I we've never met. However, you've been a topic of conversation many many doctors meetings. So. Uh, I feel like I know you without. All right. Well, meeting. I hope I hope it's all good. I pray yeah. it's all good. No, it's fantastic, fantastic. So I will Hi. let you take the reins uh, and, yeah. and we'll go from there. Okay. So um, I think I'm just going to get right into it because in my deck, I I introduce myself a little bit. So let me see if I can screen share. And I'm not the techiest person. Yeah, we'll figure out, it out there. Please. But um, but hopefully. Hopefully this will work mm -hmm. and you guys will let me know if you can see everything okay. And yep. Love it, love it. All right. And so let's let's go to slideshow and I talk about a lot of things uh, as any breast cancer doctor does. But lately, what I've been talking about most and what I wanted to come here and share with you all today is about the safety of hormone replacement therapy in the breast cancer population. Mm -hmm. I think this is a huge unmet need. I think this is a conversation that needs to be happening that should be happening way more than it is happening. I think it, it is something that it has so much fear around it. It is a highly charged topic. And if you know me, you know I don't shy away from those highly charged topics because there's usually a reason why there's so much emotion around them. And in this instance, the reason that there's so much emotion around it is because there's controversy around it coming from the commercialization industry. So... I want to get on and talk about that. And at the end, I also want to talk about my other hot topic, which is breast cancer screening. So for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm so honored to be here with you tonight. I am a breast cancer surgeon turned integrative oncologist and functional medicine physician. I spent my first 15, 16, 17 years of my career as a breast cancer surgeon and then I had the unique opportunity to become a patient. And though I didn't have breast cancer, I faced my own surgery, chemotherapy, radiation journey. And when I was put in the position to have to, to when I was given those treatment options, something about it just did not seem right to me. I don't know if I want to call it universe or God or whatever it is. But when I was faced with that decision, something told me that there was something more for me. I never judge people for making the decision that's right for them. We all make the right decision for ourselves at the time that we're making it. And at the time that I was making my decision, I walked away only to discover functional medicine. And for me, it was a turning point in my life. It was a turning point in my health. And now I am here with you today, approaching medicine from a completely different vantage point. I don't believe in throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We have amazing, amazing things in our conventional medical bag, and we should not um, desert them at all, but that there is a way of practicing medicine. And I know all of you know this because you're, you are treated at this wonderful clinic. So I know that you know that there is a balance between the two worlds and it's in finding that balance where you find your health. And along my journey, I discovered a lot of the downfalls of the conventional medical system. And one of those major, major downfalls is how we screen for breast cancer. So we're gonna get into all of that. So I'm gonna start off with asking you, why did the hormone therapy cross the road? And it's to get to the chicks that wanted it. And I was one of those chicks. 
I come from a breast cancer family. If any of you have heard my story, I grew up in Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, I had a first cousin. Her name was Linda Creed. She was a singer songwriter in the 1970s and 1980s. She wrote all the music for the spinners and the stylistics. Her most famous song was The Greatest Love of All. So she wrote that song in 1977 as the title track to the movie, The Greatest, starring Muhammad Ali, but it really received its acclaim in March of 1986 when Whitney Houston would release that song to the world. And at that time, it would spend 14 weeks at the top of the charts. Only Linda would never know. Linda died of metastatic breast cancer just one month after Whitney released that song. Linda was like every other person in my family, every other woman in my family that got breast cancer. I, when I was practicing as a breast cancer surgeon, practiced long enough to diagnose my aunt, to diagnose my mother. And for me, breast cancer was the writing on the walls. And so I finished my training in 2003. And for those of you who may or may not be aware, in 2002, the Women's Health Initiative study was halted. And with that came the overwhelming understanding or adoption of the thinking that hormone replacement causes breast cancer. So I came through all of my training and into my practice thinking that hormone replacement was never, ever, ever going to be a possibility from, for me because I came from a breast cancer family. And then about 20 years after I started to practice, I did not go quietly into my good night. I had every symptom imaginable of menopause. It was well beyond hot flashes and night sweats. And I don't belittle those things because I know how hard that is and how much women suffer. It was mood. It was, I couldn't sleep. It was, I was dizzy. It was, I couldn't find my words. It was, I had palpitations. It was, I had weakness. It was, I had joint aches, muscle aches. I was fighting with everyone. I mean, I literally had everything there was to have. And for me, I needed to really understand why I couldn't take hormone replacement because I literally wasn't living a life worth living in menopause. And so it led to this deep dive to look at the data, to, to look at the truth. And once I learned it, not only did I start taking hormone replacement myself and it changed my life, but now I'm on a mission to help other women out there because this is such an important topic. So I want to start off with making sure that everyone understands what breast cancer is, because I feel like we throw that word around so much and, or words, it's two words, um, and we just assume that everyone really knows what it is and what it means. And most people really don't. And I know that I didn't. I didn't understand what it was when I was practicing as a breast cancer surgeon, when I was running the cancer program for my hospital. So breast cancer is a normal response to an abnormal environment. And there are a number of things that cause this environmental shift. And when we have this environmental shift, when we go from the chemistry of joy to the chemistry of stress, we actually cause cellular damage. And when there's enough cellular damage, cancer starts to form. Now, cancer doesn't happen in a vacuum in that just because there's cellular damage doesn't mean that you're going to develop breast cancer because if you have an intact immune system, it should be able to recognize that cellular damage and clean it up. Either tell that cell to go away, get destroyed, or be able to repair that cell. The problem is in today's day and age, our immune system is so challenged. It is distracted by all the things in our environment. It's distracted by bad diets. It's distracted by too much stress. It's distracted by 
over-exercise, under-exercise, exposures. It, there are so many things distracting our immune system that it just can't do what it's supposed to do. So it's the combination of increased toxicity in our environment, causing this environmental shift paired with an immune system that is just not intact. And this is the recipe for breast cancer. And we actually know that the, the, the environment that breast cancer lives in is different. We can see it when we study it, when we sample it, the pH is different. It's more acidic. And when you think about it, if you know the structure of the breast, the breast is made up of four tissues. So it's made up of glandular tissue. That is the tissue that forms um, breast milk. It's made up of fat. And even someone with a dense breast has a considerable amount of fat cells. It's made of connective tissue that holds everything together. And that's all in a skin envelope. So what fat does in the body is it stores toxins. So think about the environment that these glandular cells are living in. Think about if you had a neighbor that was a hoarder. Eventually, what's going to happen is that trash, that garbage, that whatever they're holding on to is going to spill over onto your lawn. This is what's happening in the breast. The breast is the canary in the coal mine because it is one of the major places where we store toxins in our body. And so this is why breast cancer is such an issue because the breast is, is a storage basin for toxins. And really, this is not what I was taught in medical school. So what I was taught in medical school, we're going to go over later, but now we know that breast cancer is caused by oxidative stress. And there are a number of things that cause oxidative stress. So it is stress and the prolonged sympathetic state. And what I mean by that is our body only knows two modes. So it knows danger and it knows safety. And we are only built to be in that danger, um, that, that stress state, that sympathetic state. We are only supposed to be in that state less than 5% of the time. We are modern beings living on a very old gene code. So we are built to come out of the cave in the morning, encounter a saber-toothed tiger, and run like hell for 15 seconds and either get eaten or live, and then go into sympathetic rest and repair state. But we are not meant to be in that sympathetic fight or flight tone for three hours or three days or three months or three weeks or three years. And yet in today's world, our world is filled with saber-toothed tigers. They are everywhere. There are cell phones, they are our computers. They're how available we are. They're how much light we take in. I should really put my <laughs> blue light glasses on. They are, are, these stressors are everywhere. They're deadlines. They're difficult relationships. They're all of these things. And we are spending way too much time in sympathetic tone. And because of that, this is causing damage of our cells. It's directly damaging our cells. Other things that we encounter all the time are these chronic infections. So every single person who I treat for breast cancer, the first thing I have them do is get a cone CT of the mouth because we harbor these chronic infections in our mouth and you don't even have to be symptom symptomatic. You could have had a root canal. You could have had your wisdom tooth extracted many, many years ago. You don't have to have symptoms. But if you have these cavitations, these kind of dead cavities in your mouth, they are harboring bacteria and the mouth and the breast communicate. And we see biopsies of breast tissue that have these organisms in them that are causing chronic inflammation and they're coming from the mouth. 
So oral health is of utmost importance, and that has to be dealt with in anyone that has a breast cancer diagnosis. I always work to clean up their oral microbiome and to clean up any infections in the mouth. The other thing that we often find in the mouth are heavy metals because dental amalgams, the metal dental amalgams are 50% mercury by weight. And that mercury is off gas and getting readily absorbed into the bloodstream and it's actually causing toxicity. So that's another reason to really be sure that the oral piece is tied in. The other place that is commonly a source of chronic infections is the, is the gut, is the abdomen. Parasites are almost ubiquitous. They are literally everywhere. You don't have to eat sushi. You don't have to eat raw meat. You can eat strawberries and get parasites. They are literally everywhere. And so in my practice, I make sure that people do a parasite cleanse at least once a year, at least. I happen to use the Cellcore products, but there are a number of ways to do that. And if anyone wants the link to, to what I do, I'm happy to share that with you at the end. Um, but I do a parasite cleanse. My team does a parasite cleanse. And every single person that I work with does a parasite cleanse at least once a year. If you see a lot of organisms, then I tell people to do it twice a year. But that's, that's another place that is harboring these kind of chronic indolent infections. We know that alcohol and tobacco are sources of oxidative stress. We know that alcohol, any amount of alcohol will increase your risk of breast cancer. Please don't shoot the messenger. The American Cancer Society says that there is no safe amount of alcohol for women. I am pretty strict with my patients in that if you are actively cancering, there is no room for alcohol in your diet. If you are many years into away from your diagnosis and into health, and you want to enjoy an occasional glass of alcohol, that is up to you. Like I'm not out here to police anyone, but we need to know what our risks are. There are so many issues with us being truly informed that Information is power, and I just want you to have it so that you can use it. I don't think I need to explain why tobacco is bad for you, but suffice to say that it is very pro-inflammatory. Short sleepers, people who sleep less than six hours a night, are at risk for a whole host of chronic diseases, being overweight, being obese, hypertensive, diabetic, uh, you have respiratory problems, gut problems, just Think about how you feel after even one night's poor sleep and add that day after day after day. Think about how your brain works after one night's poor sleep and add that day after day after day. Think about the choices that you make after you lose one night of sleep and add that day after day after day. So short sleepers have a real problem in terms of chronic illness. And we know that even if you're not a short sleeper, but you sleep during the, the wrong time. So people who do shift work and they're not aligned with circadian rhythm, they're not aligned with the rhythm of the sun. These people have higher risks of all chronic disease, including breast cancer. So short sleeping and sleeping during the day when you should be sleeping at night, when you're not aligned with the rhythm of the sun, this is a problem in terms of hormonal balance and overall health. Trauma is something that is not talked about enough. The body is absolutely positively without question keeping score. And we need to find a way to safely deal with past trauma. And also a breast cancer diagnosis is traumatic. When we look at the population of women that are diagnosed with breast cancer, we look at early breast cancers, 30% of women will have trauma in their background. And when we look at the population of women who are diagnosed with metastatic disease, 80% of them will have trauma in their background. There are a number of ways to kind of make, uh, uh, resolve that trauma, uh, Hopkins is doing amazing work with psilocybin and facilitating journey, facilitated journeys. There are a number of ways to facilitate a journey. Um, and I think we're going to be hearing more and more and more about this as time goes on. But suffice to say that if you have trauma in your background and you have not given it resolution, you have not dealt with it, you have not done the work uh, to get over it, then it is you are allowing that to continue to hurt you today. And it is. 
Radiation is a known carcinogen. And I know that we use radiation to treat breast cancer. I have my whole own opinion about that, that you can read about in my book, The Smart Woman's Guide to Breast Cancer, uh, that is available on Amazon starting on April 1st. Um, but we know that radiation is a carcinogen. And there, when we talk about radiation, we divide it into two areas. We talk about um, low level radiation or um, non ionizing radiation and high level radiation with ionizing radiation. And ionizing radiation, we know directly damages DNA. So I'm talking about things like x rays and CAT scans and PET scans and bone scans and HIDA scans and um, and then certainly the radiation that is used to treat cancer. And anytime you're doing any of those studies or that treatment, you really have to think about a risk benefit um, ratio. And you have to have this conversation with whoever is recommending the study or the treatment. Because when we actually look at the radiation data, there is no survival benefit for radiation. So then you have to have a really, really, really good reason to use it. I reserve radiation for people who have a single metastasis in somewhere else in their body that's not operable. Uh, it is very useful in those, in those situations, but I do not use radiation for local control in the breast. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about that later. As far as imaging studies, I am... Uh, I am someone who only uses imaging studies if it is really going to change my treatment paradigm and my recommendations. And if I do that, I make sure to pre-medicate people with things like melatonin, liposomal vitamin C, vitamin E, the mixed tocopherols, um, uh, alpha lipoic acid. There are a number of things that you can use to bind up the free radicals that are generated when you undergo radiographic studies. But you... I, you absolutely should be doing that if you're undergoing these studies or skip the studies. There are any number of toxins in our environment. Oh, and also for radiation, I didn't talk about the EMF. It's, it's all the devices, it's anything with a plug. And overall, we just need to continue to decrease the amount of time we spend on a screen, the amount of time we spend inside. I would get rid of microwaves. I would get rid of gaming stations, Xbox, turn off your Wi-Fi router at night. I, I write about all of this in my book. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time here, but just know that the electromagnetic field is definitely contributing to poorer health. And there are a number of toxins in our environment. The most notable toxins that I want to talk about are the xenoestrogens. These are the synthetic estrogens, things like plastics, plasticizers, uh, antibiotics, things with fragrance, artificial flavors, um, uh, cleaning products, uh, lots of uh, personal care products. These all have uh, oh, non-stick pans. These all have plasticizers or xenoestrogens in them that are actually acting on our estrogen receptors as a kind of toxic turn on. So they, they are kind of like estrogen in that they can bind to the reception receptor, but they don't behave normally like estrogen. Estrogen itself as a compound is very protective. These are not, and these are wreaking havoc on our endocrine system, on our hormonal system. So avoiding as many toxins as you can is highly beneficial. Poor gut health, eating a lot of processed foods or eating even foods that are not right for you uh, lead to decreased immunity and a whole host of medical problems. So gut health is a huge issue. Our microbiome, that that collection of organisms that lives in and on us, that microbiome, 70 to 80% of it lives in our gut, where 70 to 80% of our immune system is housed. And our microbiome is in direct communication with our immune system at all times. So if you do not have a healthy microbiome, you cannot have a healthy immune system. And that sets the stage for breast cancer. So we need to make sure that we are eating the right kind of diet for us, and we are eating with a lot of diversity, a whole food, um, plant-based, low glycemic, grain-free diet so that, uh, and where you get your protein is up to you, but 
we want to make sure that there's lots of diversity in your diet so that you can have the healthiest microbiome possible. There are two things in terms of movement that are harmful. We know sedentary lifestyle, sitting is the new smoking. So without question, if you don't move your body, you're going to lose your body. And with movement, we need to think about absolutely cardiovascular exercise and moving around. We know from the blue zones that those people are active throughout their entire life, and they are the example of which we want to follow. So they're doing their own gardening, they're lifting their own packages, they're lifting heavy things, they're moving all the time, they're not in cars, they live very active lives during the day and they sleep when the sun goes down. So that is very important. And so we want to make sure that we're moving and we're moving correctly. Over exercise is also an issue. And I can't tell you how many people have turned up to my office saying, I don't understand. I'm so healthy. And how did I get breast cancer? I'm a marathon. And again, that goes back to that fight or flight state that we were talking about. We are not meant to be in that fight or flight state for more than 5% of the time. And marathon runners spend a lot of time in that fight or flight state running away from the saber to tigers of the world. So over-exercise is as much of an issue as sedentary lifestyle. And lastly, visceral adiposity. So when we look at our waist to hip ratio, in a woman, it should be 0.8. And if it is higher than that, you are, care- you are most likely, there, there are some exceptions. If you're a weightlifter, like a serious weightlifter, it's not going to be like that. Um, but otherwise... Visceral adiposity is fat cells that are building up around your abdomen, around your gut. And these fat cells are not benign. And they are sending these dangerous signals to your body and and actually provoking disease and very pro-inflammatory. So these are the things that I think about in terms of causing breast cancer. But when I was trained, I was mostly taught that it's early first period, late age of menopause, a genetic mutation or hormone therapy, relatives. And we really, we really came up thinking that the problem is estrogen. And estrogen causes breast cancer was this prevailing theory. And the notion that estrogen causes breast cancer is logical and it's widely accepted. And it's also wrong. Breast cancer, if 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 estrogen caused breast cancer, then why do we see the vast majority of breast cancers happening in the postmenopausal woman who has a paucity of estrogen? She hardly has any estrogen. If estrogen caused breast cancer, why don't we see it during the times of life where estrogen is abundant? Why don't we see it in teenagers? Why don't we see it in pregnant women whose estrogen levels are 10 times what a non-pregnant woman's estrogen is? The reason that estrogen causes breast cancer is so accepted is because we see estrogen receptors on some, on 70 to 80% of cancer cells, of breast cancer cells. But do you know where else we see estrogen receptors? On 100% of normal breast cells. It is a version of normal. And we have capitalized on that because we came up with estrogen blockers. But the truth is, that estrogen does not cause breast cancer. And in fact, it has been effectively used to treat breast cancer. Estrogen itself is protective. Now, if estrogen caused breast cancer, when we look at the risk of developing breast cancer, it only increases with age. And as we age and ovarian function slows, estrogen production dies off precipitously. So when you're 30, you have a risk of developing breast cancer of one in 227. And when you're 70, you have a risk of developing breast cancer in one of 26. So at 30, you have exponentially more estrogen than at 70. And just looking at the incidence of new breast cancers, according to age, you can see it is exponentially more common in the 70s and 80s than it is in the 20s and 30s when we really have our preponderance of estrogen. So estrogen does not cause breast cancer. 
But what about hormone replacement? Is hormone replacement somehow different? Is that the problem? Well, let's look at the number of new breast cancers starting in 1999 and going to 2020, because the world was far different in 2020 than it was in 1999. Because in 1999, hormone replacement was readily prescribed. And the majority of menopausal women, they were all offered it. And the majority of menopausal women went on hormone replacement to manage menopausal symptoms. Now, around 2002 or 2003 is when the Women's Health Initiative study was was halted and the results, the preliminary results were released. And you can see what happens with the incidence of breast cancer since that time. It has only gone up. So as women have stopped using hormone replacement, the incidence of breast cancer has only gone up. This drop off in 2020, as you very well know, is because women did not go for mammograms. So in looking at a study from 2001, pre-Women's Health Initiative, the evidence did not support the hypothesis that estrogen use increases the risk of breast cancer and that combined hormone therapy increases the risk more than estrogen alone. Yeah, I won't read the rest. I have a bar in my, in my, in my way. So looking at all the studies that were done on hormone replacement study on hormone replacement therapy between 1975 and 2000, there were 65 studies, 45 of them are, were, were on estrogen replacement alone. 20 of them were on combined hormone replacement. 82% of the estrogen alone found no increased risk. 13% found a small increased risk and 5% found a decreased risk. In the combined study, 80% showed no increased risk, 10% a small increased risk, and 10% showed a decreased risk. And that's how things stood until 2001. And the Women's Health Initiative comes into play. Now, this was a study. It was a billion-dollar study with 161,000 what was called healthy although we can argue that postmenopausal women between the ages of 50 and 79. And the main goal was to determine if hormone replacement decreased cardiovascular risk, decreased bone loss, decreased dementia, and whether or not it was associated with breast cancer. And four years later, the study was halted due to what was called a 20%, 26% increase in breast cancer incidence amongst the group taking HRT compared to the placebo group. And this almost reached nominal statistical significance. So we halted the biggest study that will ever be for something that almost reached nominal statistical st significance. And I want you to know where that 26% came from. It was the difference between five women in a thousand that got breast cancer in the control group compared to six women in a thousand that got breast cancer in the hormone replacement group. That was the difference. That was the 26% that the study was halted for. So as a result of the Women's Health Initiative finding in 2002, 3 million women stopped taking hormone replacement overnight. HRT research was halted. The FDA added a black box warning to Primpo and thousands of lawsuits were filed. And Phil DeSea said the media is not interested in the facts. So early termination of that Women's Health Initiative was was done based on one person in a thousand getting and getting breast cancer. And because of this study, decades and decades of women have suffered. Now, we do have the long-term data. 
The study was halted in 2002. In 2003, they saw a small difference in breast cancer incidence between the groups. By 2006, there was no difference. And then, um, and then long-term results were, were then printed in 2017 and all of the conclusions were retracted. I'm going to show you that. There were a lot of problems with the Women's Health Initiative other than this false reporting. It said it was healthy women. Uh, more than 50% of the women were overweight, obese, hypertensive, hypercholesterolemic, or had a history of smoking. Not exactly healthy women. The average age in the study was 63. We know that people get the most benefit from hormone replacement. In the first 10 years, the average age of menopause in this country is 52. So these women were more than 10 years out from menopause. There was no pre-screening. We don't know if women came into the study with a breast cancer or not. We used synthetic hormone replacement. We did not use bioidentical. And there were a number of people in the control group that had pre-treatment with hormone replacement. And we expect those women to have a lower incidence, which is actually what happened. So the trial overstated the hormone replacement risk for younger women. A principal inv investigator of the landmark study says that the initial results that linked hormone replacement therapy to breast cancer and heart attacks were misleading and distorted for publicity. And during the cumulative 18-year follow-up amongst the 27,347 postmenopausal women in the WHI hormone therapy trials, the combine, the, the estrogen plus progesterone and the estrogen alone were not associated with increase or decreased risk of all-cause cardiovascular or total mortality. So hormone replacement doesn't cause breast cancer. So why do we even need to consider hormone replacement after breast cancer treatment? Like, why is this important to me? Why am I bringing this up? Well, this is because 99% of women with early breast cancer will survive their disease. And I want to make sure that they survive their disease and live a life worth living because there are many, many side effects to breast cancer treatment. First of all, most breast cancer treatments put women in menopause, whether they had reached that point or not. The side effects of breast cancer are that they accelerate aging. They da so, I'm sorry, the side effects of breast cancer treatment. They accelerate aging. They damage the delicate gut microbiome. They accelerate heart disease. They accelerate brain disease, bone loss. They promote depression and anxiety. These are major, major problems. We are forever changing both the quality and the quantity of the rest of women's life when we treat them for breast cancer. And a lot of it is because we do not give them hormone replacement afterwards. And there is an increased risk of cardiovascular disease after breast cancer treatment. And women who are treated for breast cancer are two to three times more likely to die of heart disease than women who are not treated for breast cancer. And this is a huge problem. We cannot trade in one problem for the other. And women die exponentially more of heart disease in every decade of their life past 30 than they do of breast cancer. And we need to care about the heart as much as or more than we are currently do doing. So again, the, the symptoms of menopause are and the treatment of breast cancer accelerates heart disease, bone loss, there's cognitive decline, sleep disturbance, mood disturbance, joint pain, brain fog, loss of libido, vaginal atrophy, incontinence, and urgency. And these are symptoms that make life miserable. And hormone replacement fixes that. A major concern over prescribing estrogen replacement for women with a history of breast cancer is that dormant cancer cells might be activated. There is surprisingly little information to substantiate that concern. Use of hormone replacement may, at least in theory, increase the risk of recurrence of cancer, but its categoric refusal is a double-edged sword because it also denies the women all the indisputable benefits that HRT provides. So refusal to pre prescribe HRT is a double-edged sword because the available studies fail to demonstrate that HRT worsens prognosis 
HR tree has not been demonstrated to increase the risk of recurrence, and it denies women with a history of breast cancer all the indisputable benefits that HRT pr provides. So there are 12 studies in, in women with a history of breast cancer, and though they are low numbers, none of them showed an increased risk of recurrence. And in fact, some of them showed a reduced risk of recurrence and an increase in survival. The only study that did not show a decrease or neutral finding for hormone replacement was one of the two Swedish studies. So the HABIT study, hormone replacement after breast cancer, is it safe? The HABIT study was one of the, one of the Swedish studies, and it looked at the long-term safety of hormone therapy in breast cancer survivors. And there was no increase in breast cancer recurrence in hormone therapy alone. However, they did have a subset, have a subset of women that had hormone replacement and tamoxifen. And it was only in this group that they saw an increased risk of breast cancer recurrence. The other study that was done at the same time was the Stockholm study. And the Stockholm study did not have that arm. It did not have a hormone replacement plus tamoxifen arm. And that study did not show an increased risk of recurrence or, um, or death from breast cancer in the hormone replacement group. So there were a lot of problems with a habit study. First of all, 20% of the patients were excluded from analysis because they had not completed follow-up. There was no pre-staging criteria. So they didn't look to see which women had more aggressive disease before they randomized them to a group. There was no prior cancer testing. They have no idea who came into the study already having cancer. And there was no attempt to determine if recurrence risk factors were equal between the groups. But the Stockholm study showed a no difference in 10-year mortality and no difference in new breast cancers in the women who had breast cancer and received HRT. Much of the study designs of both studies were similar, but their goals were a little different. The Stockholm study looked to see if they could decrease the amount of progesterone that women got. Because the HABIT study halted both those studies, it is therefore most regrettable that these randomized trials were halted prematurely as we will now probably never get a true answer. For individual women who are taking HRT, they can be reassured that any risk for breast cancer is small and certainly smaller than the risks posed by many lifestyle factors. Given for the correct reasons, the benefits of HRT far outweigh the risks. Of the 20 studies published between 1980 and 2008, only the HABIT study found an increase in breast cancer amongst women on HRT, and only if they were also taking tamoxifen. So what is my approach to the woman with breast cancer? Well, I want to make sure that she com completes treatment. I want to make sure that she's tumor-free. I want to work on why she had breast cancer and minimize her risk of recurrence through diet and lifestyle and toxin avoidance. I want to evaluate her for already having symptoms of hormone deficiency and meet her where she is. I want to evaluate her hormones. I want to look at her DNA and look at her SNPs, um, make sure that her detoxification pathways are open and working. And I want to help her optimize her environment. And then I want to consider prescribing hormone replacement for her if and when it's appropriate. Even if you are not going to do systemic hormones, please consider vaginal estrogen. Vaginal estrogen is safe in individuals with a history of hormone receptor positive cancer, and, and it is safe for everyone. It is not associated with an increased risk for recurrence or mortality. There are occasions when the indications for hormone replacement must take precedence over any theoretical obje objections. It is clearly inhumane when a woman who is already having to cope with the physical and psychological burdens of breast cancer is then expected to accept without relief some of the serious effects of menopause, which can include severe depression. People with breast cancer are people too, and they don't deserve to suffer. Now, I wanna move on to screening a little bit. I want to first talk about mammograms because we have been suffering under our screening mammographic uh, 
program since the 1970s. Mammograms, I don't have to tell you, they're traumatic. And, you know, it's not just about the pain and the compression, because if that were all it was, women are tough, right? We can deal with things when they, we know that they're for the good. But mammograms are also inaccurate. They will miss 40% of cancers and 40% of women. And those are the women with dense breasts. There is a radiation risk, and that radiation risk is not insignificant. So mammograms alone will cause 5,000 breast cancers a year just mammograms alone. They are responsible for overdiagnosis and overtreatment. For every 2,000 women that we screen, 10 of them will be treated unnecessarily for cancer. They are treated for a cancer that would never have threatened their life. And it doesn't sound that bad when I give you that number. So let me give you this number. 185,000 women every single year are treated for cancer that don't need to be treated. These are staggering numbers. And these, this is a problem. We are told mammograms are safe. We are told that it's no different than flying cross country. Well, you know what? When you fly cross country, the radiation is scattered. When you have a mammogram, all that radiation is dialed down into your breast. And there are a number of things that we were told by the FDA, by physicians, by the system that are safe. We were told cigarettes were safe. There was a time when doctors were telling people what brand to smoke. We were told Vioxx was safe until we learned that it caused heart attacks. We were told Oxycontin was safe until we learned that we were creating drug addicts from day one. And many, many people have lost their lives on behalf of Oxycontin. So it's time to abandon mammography. There's no question about that. It is harmful and needs to be abandoned. And this is a letter uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine from the Swiss Medical Board saying that if mammogram screening had been a drug, it would have been withdrawn from the market long ago. Many drugs are withdrawn, although they benefit many patients, when serious harms are reported in rather few. The situation with mammography screening is the opposite. Very few, if any, will benefit, whereas many will be harmed. And... The evidence of harm and the lack of benefit led the Swiss Medical Board to recommend abolishing mammography as a mass screening program. So just to look at the statistics, mammography was introduced in the 1970s. In 1977, a randomized trial showed no mortality benefit from mammography, meaning that there is no benefit to screening with mammography. You are no less likely to die of breast cancer if you screen than if you don't. The Cochrane Review found no reduction in breast cancer deaths with mammography, and the lifetime risk of cancer is increased with the more mammograms you have. So what about MRI for screening? Well, this is another medical practice that we're told is safe that now we know causes harms. And it's not about the fact that they're uncomfortable. Again, we can deal with discomfort when we know it's for the good, but it uses gadolinium. This is a heavy metal that is stored in our body. And whenever we store something in the body, we store it at the, at the expense of something that we need. And it displaces that and causes pathology. There are access issues. It's expensive, but the biggest problem with MR is the gadolinium. So I am so delighted to introduce a new technology to you. I hope that it will come to your clinic very soon. This is called QT imaging. This is a way of imaging the breast and screening for breast cancer that is painless, more accurate than anything that's out there. It, there is no compression. There is no radiation. It uses sound waves transmitted through water to create a 3D image with 200,000 times more data points than MRI and 40 times the resolution of MRI. It is the only functional imaging on the market, meaning that if we see something, we can bring you back in 60 days and count the cells and count a doubling time. Cancers have a doubling time of less than 100 days, and things that are benign have a doubling time of greater than 100 days. So if you come back and you, we find that you have a doubling time of 150 days, we say, see you next year, and you avoid unnecessary biopsy, unnecessary treatment. And it just makes the whole system make sense. So it is going to replace mammogram, MRI, and ultrasound. And uh, I have the, it is FDA approved. It is meeting an unmet medical need as screening for women, high risk for breast cancer 
and it is the first FDA approved device to screen for breast cancer in women with dense breasts in 50 years. So as far as screening options, for me, I still love self-examination. I think it's very important to know your breast, know your body, because no one is ever going to know you better than you know yourself. Thermography, while it's not a screening tool for cancer, it is a screening tool for inflammation, and I find it very useful for that. Ultrasound is safe, though not that sensitive, and QT will replace everything else. So that is all I have for you today. If you are looking for more information from me, you can email me either at info at realhealthmd.com or perfectionimaging at outlook.com. You can find me on all the social media outlets at Dr. Jen Simmons. Um, and if you're not listening to my podcast, Keeping Abreast with Dr. Jen, you can find that on anywhere that you find your podcasts. And that's it for now. Hi. 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 How are you? <laughs> I'm well, Dr. Yeah, Simmons. You it. did so well. So well, well. Thank you. Thank you. And so many of my patients, thanks to you, be, have already um, had QT. I've had many, as you know, patients already have it done. I'm and, so glad. And so hopefully uh, sometime in May, we will be getting our unit. That's amazing. Um, I, I had can't a meeting. Wait. Yes, I have. You'll had be a sure meeting. to tell me so I can scream it from the rooftops. Okay, <laughs> great. Because there's not that many yet, but people need to understand that usually when something new innovation comes out, it can take three to five years to be mainstream. Yeah. And so Agreed. I <laughs> Although I am, I'm, I'm going to open seven centers this year. So your people who are on the East Coast, were, I'm, I got you covered. I got That's you covered great. and I plan to open uh, 20 in 2025. Oh. So I'm working on it. I'm working yeah. as fast as I can. Yeah. So when are the ones on the East coast? Uh, yeah. So uh, the first one will be in the suburbs of Philadelphia and that will be in June. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you follow me on social media, you'll hear all about it. Okay, great. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, this patient just said, thank God I'm in Maine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So New York will be the closest for you. And that will be, um, hopefully that one will be open by December. Right. Wonderful. So let's take some questions now. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know, what, how do we get, yeah, I'm going to take the yep. question right there. Pull them up right here. Yeah. All right. So what are your thoughts on CDK, CDK 4.6 for reoccurrence prevention, uh, IDC stage 1B grade 2, case KI 67, 25%? Yeah. So, you know, I, I totally hear you that, you know, this is your pathology report and, and this is what you're identifying with. For me, it's a bigger picture, right? So I always want to back up and say, why did this happen? What is the message here? What is happening in your body? What are the environmental changes that, that occurred within you? What does your terrain look like? What does your landscape look like? What does your environment look like? And I'm always going back to that. I'm always going back to that. The pathology report for me is like, okay, you know, and, and sometimes we are going to use those targeted therapies. I mean, we're going to use all the tools in our toolbox, but the most important thing to me is why did this happen and what can we do to optimize your health around that? Right. And uh, yeah. So, and also you have to take into consideration as Dr. Simmons already talked about all the root causes. Okay. Um, and you must address all of those. You know, a lot of people just think, oh, you just get a drive through surgery, chemo and radiation. And we all know that that is not the answer. Sometimes surgery may be necessary. Sometimes chemotherapy may be necessary. I think Dr. Simmons and I share the same philosophy on radiation. Uh, so I, I, I decide on that particular treatment based upon pathology and many other factors. Yeah. Uh, but to use a very significant drug as your only treatment for re 
prevention of cancer is not a good idea. You know, you must change the terrain, the garden, the environment that the cancer came in. You must address every facet, as we talked about on an earlier slide. You need to go after circulating tumor cells. Uh, circulating tumor cells are responsible for 95% of metastasis. So just relying on a drug which damages your mitochondria, and we know that your mitochondria health is of utmost important for the cell to protect you. So, so you must not, you know, just do that. And you must address all the facets that we've talked about today, whether it's parasites, yeast, metals, et cetera. So uh, I think, so I think everyone needs to remember that cancer is never a surgery deficiency, a chemotherapy deficiency, a radiation deficiency. So those things are never going to get you well, right? They may be necessary evils along the way. I mean, sometimes you are just in a position where you may need that kind of support, but no one ever got healthier from any of those modalities. <laughs> no one ever got healthier from any of those modalities. And so this journey, this, this process needs to be about building health. And sometimes you are going to take two steps back to take one step forward. I get it that health is not linear, but we always have to keep our eye on the prize and that is getting healthy. And so we always have to be building towards that. Right, exactly. And that's what the medical profession doesn't do is they're not building health while they're treating you. And so, because, you know, we've talked about the length of time that it takes to develop cancer. It takes 10 years. That means we had nine years of opportunity to prevent cancer. And that's where we should be focusing on prevention and early detection in our doctor meeting today. That's what we talked about. And not just of cancer, but all chronic diseases, because now we're seeing, you know, you mentioned heart disease. Well, heart disease is preventable. Okay. And yeah. I don't even have uh, in our clinic, in our practice, we do not even have a heart attack once a year because of our prevention and early detection of diseases. And so um, that, but any time that you do a biopsy, you do surgery, you do chemo, you must be building health at the same time because surgery is an injurious immunosuppressive process. Chemo is radiation and medications are all affecting your immune system and they're injurious to the body. So, uh, and that's what patients, I think, I mean, I believe patients are getting smarter, though, they're understanding that they've got to start getting healthy at the time of their diagnosis, because they're yeah. like, all oh, like, what happened here, you know, I do wish that there was more adoption in yeah. mainstream medicine, though, because I, 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 I know, and I see it all the time, and I'm sure you see it all the time, that even if the patient is there, even if the patient understands that they need to do more, there is still so much pressure from families and friends and- And their doctor. And, and their doctor, and they get the you shoulds. You should do this. You should do that. And they get scared to walk outside of that conventional paradigm. Right. And- I, I just wish that in the conventional chemotherapy suites and and sent and cancer centers around the country that they were adopting this a little quicker. Like, what would be the harm in having people fast while they were getting chemotherapy? What would be the harm in actually giving them sound nutritional advice? Right. Like, I, I don't get the resistance. Right. Don't. Yeah, we, we know because our patients every day tell us, oh, if you mention IV vitamin C, they go like, what? Don't even mention that. They just completely yeah. resistant. And I'm like, well, what? Why haven't they done any research? You know, yeah. so it's very sad. And so many patients are, are losing out. You want to say the next question? Yeah. So uh, this patient just met with you tonight, and then she's looking for a breast cancer oncologist on the East Coast that is open to integrative medicine. We may found one. <laughs> Mine is DFCI, and our relationship is coming to an end due to the fact that he isn't open to integrative medicine. 
So that's for Miss Jamie. Yeah. So, I, you know, listen, go ahead and reach out to me. I, I know my practice is pretty full. I don't I don't know what my bandwidth is, but but we can help. We can help to refer you if it's not. Yeah, to here. refer someone right. since you're on the East Coast. She's seeing me here. Uh, but oh, she, oh, oh, OK. She's seeing me here, but she is in Massachusetts. And uh, yeah. and so unfortunately, the doctor just dim- dismisses the patient really. Yeah. And, and I, I think that this is happening more times than we than we can even count. Right. And my advice is that if you are not on the same page with your doctor, if your doctor isn't giving you the same amount of respect and listening that you're giving said doctor, it's time to move on. Right. I and agree. the world is changing. It may not be changing fast enough for, for our liking, but the world is changing. And there are people that are opening their eyes and seeing that there are patients that are doing things outside of the doctor's office and getting better outcomes. And there are doctors out there that are curious and there are doctors out there that are willing to partner with you. The days of paternalistic medicine are over. We, we have to partner with patients because the truth is that health doesn't happen in the doctor's office doesn't happen in the hospital, doesn't happen in the chemotherapy suite, health happens at home. So we have to partner with our patients so that they can get those ideal outcomes. And you will, if you keep looking, you'll find the right person. Right, I agree with that. Yeah, good response. So one of the questions, is there a good parasite cleanse that can be purchased and done in home? And Dr. Simmons mentioned the CellCore product. Yes, you can, we use that too. We also do medications when... Cell core doesn't work. We use a variety of uh, medications. So, uh, but so you can order that uh, cell core product online. Cone beam. How dangerous is the cone beam CT of the mouth? Yeah. So this is one of those areas where I think about the risk benefit analysis, and I know that it's so it's nearly impossible to get someone well if they have active infection in their mouth. So I have them pre-medicate. I have them do 100 milligrams to, uh, to anywhere from 100 to 300 milligrams of melatonin. Don't worry, it won't put you to sleep. That's not a sleep dose. It's an anti-inflammatory dose. Between two to 4,000 milligrams of liposomal vitamin C. Um, and, uh, and you can also do uh, turmeric. And I have them do it one hour before their their scan and then for the subsequent three days. And, you know, we just do the best we can. Would it be ideal to not get radiation? For sure. But th- this is one of the tools that we need to ensure that your mouth is healthy. Right. And so many doctors don't. I had a, my, what my first patient today was a dentist, a uh, 32 year old. A uh, brand new diagnosis of breast cancer. And it was a very interesting story, and I brought it up into the doctor's today meeting. And so it was so interesting because she went to the doctor who was not a doctor, who was a nurse practitioner, and she said, "Oh, I'm having a discharge, a yellowish, whitish discharge from my breast. She's not pregnant. She's not breastfeeding or anything." And she says, when I squeeze it, more liquid comes out. So she goes and tells the practitioner and she says, well, don't squeeze your breast and doesn't do any imaging, doesn't do any blood, doesn't do anything. So I said, first of all, like doctors and practitioners need to listen to the patient. Okay. That's the whole thing. And you must advocate for yourself. You can't ever take, no, this isn't, this is okay. No, you got to make sure it's okay. So finally, she went, uh, you know, a month later, because I guess, of course, it kept reoccurring. And she did get image. And, you know, finally, they they immediately actually sent her to a surgeon. And then, um, uh, unfortunately, she, um, you know, had diagnosis of breast cancer. And she opted to remove both of her breasts now. And so she's asked the doctor, so how are you going to follow me? And so that, oh, we'll just see you in six months. And we're like, oh, she's like, no, that just can't be. So anyway, and her mother's a dentist. And now they, you know, I gave them lots of different information to become biological dentist and everything. So comb beam, I personally have done it myself. I'm sure you've done it too. 
uh, but uh, it is a way of evaluating really literally your entire circum, you know, entire circumference of your head. And, uh, you know, you, there's a lot of, lot of clues. You've got to, you really need to partner with a dentist who can properly read the cone. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's so you another. don't want to you don't want to read the static images, right? You have you have it has to be read by someone who is reading the three D study because that's the only way that you're going to pick up on these cavitations that we're looking for. Right, exactly. So one of the things that I use and recommend uh, for all the patients doing a CT, PET CT or CT, is because it is radiation, and as Doctor Simmons says, it is a, you know, it is causing damage, no matter what, I don't care how you slice it. Yeah. So she mentioned the liposomal Z and melatonin. I use something called super oxide, oxide dismutase SOD. So we naturally make SOD in our cells. So we just give the patients a very high dose for a month. And then I give them a bath to, for detox. So, and uh, you can also use carbon 60. Right. Mm-hmm. We use carbon 60 a lot too. Yeah. Um, all right. The next question uh, is Nagalase a good test marker as a routine blood test for breast cancer? Can the other issues cause elevated Nagalase levels? So I'm not sure uh, if you know about Nagalase, but we do it routinely in our office. And uh, it's good for any kind of patient, not necessarily as the only marker, it's a marker, but I wouldn't say it's the only marker because it can be elevated with viruses and cancer and heart disease. So it's a, it's a good overall marker. And so Nagalase is normally in your blood, but if it's elevated, it is basically interfering with the macrophages to attack the abnormal cells. So yes, it is a good test to do. And there are things to correct it if it is elevated. In conjunction with other tests. So it's, yes. it's a, it's it's not a, a standalone. That's, that's good, but you want to paint the entire picture. For right, sure. right. Yeah. It's like just doing one little blood test on the hundreds of blood tests, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it's, it's just a piece of the puzzle. So, yeah. All right. So um, yeah. this is for Dr. So this is for you. Uh, doc, uh, what do you use for localized treatment after lumpectomy, i.e. stray cells remaining after biopsy, installation of markers and surgery? How about cells that have escaped, escaped and are circulating or have metastasized? So I'm not understanding the localized treatment after lumpectomy. Are, are you asking me if I'm advocating for radiation? It looks my like guess. it says, it says, what do you guess. use for localized treatment after a lepectomy? So like she's saying, what do you do for the treatment for rogue cells that may be released after a lumpectomy? Yeah. Like. So that is kind of the story that the radiation oncologist tells you, right? Um, and we, we, we know that the data does not show an increase in survival between women who have lumpectomy and get radiation and women who don't get radiation. So for me, survival is the only indicator that we should be following. And if you get radiation, there are a number of things that come along with said radiation. So if you consider the benefit, a decrease in local recurrence, meaning that a decreased risk of the breast cancer coming back in your breast. And when we talk about what that absolute benefit is, it's really small. In exchange for that, depending on which side we're talking about, on the left side, not only are you going to get fibrosis and scarring in your breast, but we have to think about all the tissues that are beneath your breast that are also getting treated with radiation. So radiation is a known carcinogen, so it increases your risk of a secondary cancer, and then it will cause fibrosis of the chest wall, of the muscles of the chest wall. It will weaken your bones and make you susceptible to having rib fractures later on from very minimal impact, like a sneeze or a cough. And rib fractures have a a very high mortality rate because if you, they're very hard to heal and they affect your, your breathing system. So then going beyond the ribs on the left side, there's the heart. 
And radiation makes you more prone to both cardiovascular disease by affecting the vessels of the heart, but also a cardiomyopathy because it affects the muscle of the heart. And we know that women who are treated for breast cancer are two to three times more likely to die of cardiovascular disease, of heart disease, than women who are not treated. And radiation is one of the reasons why. And then beyond the heart is the lungs. And we know that radiation leads to lung dysfunction and restrictive lung disease. So there are a lot of downsides in the, in the risk column and not a lot in the benefit column. Radiation does not have any effect, any benefit for those stray cells that may escape and circulate. So there is no benefit there to radiation. So for people with local disease in the breast that undergo lumpectomy, I do not advocate for radiation. What I do advocate for is all the things that we talked about before. Why did you get breast cancer? Why did this happen? Where is the imbalance? What can you correct? Where, you know, where in your terrain can you find balance? Can you, um, you know, correct anything that might be standing in the way of your health and just going through all the things that we talked about tonight. I mean, ultimately I divide it into, you know, yes, I'm certainly looking for infections. I'm looking at the diet to make sure that you're on the right diet for you. I'm looking at movement. I'm looking at sleep. I'm looking at mindset. I'm looking at the stressors. I'm looking at trauma. Uh, again, looking at micro infections, looking at the, tr at, at the toxins in your environment. And then, you know, at the end, we all have to live life with purpose. And whatever that purpose is, you have to live your purpose. Uh, because life needs to be worth living. And so it's, for me, it's really about putting that whole picture together to put you on the road to health and wellness. Very true. Yeah. Very true. And also, uh, you know, again, you're looking at you still have to you got to get to the why, where, when, and how, and look at the circulating tumor cells and the doctors. If you, I saw in a patient that came in and the doctor, the radiation oncologist did write down all the risk factors. Okay. And so then the patient goes, well, wait a second, you know, after I read all this, I'm not going to get radiation. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I agree with her. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have a real issue in our society with informed consent. Right. Exactly. And we are not giving women the facts. We're not giving them the facts about screening. We're not giving them the facts about treatment. We're not giving them the facts. And they, they are not agreeing to these things in, in a way that has true informed consent. Right. Right. So this patient, a uh, couple sessions of chemo and they wanted to ask if uh, they're a little wary, uh, can they regain their health or is the damage already done? Yeah. So I, I mean, it's a matter of time and you can detox after chemo, but right. there, there definitely is damage without question. And it is going to be harder to reclaim your health with more toxins in your body. Uh, but, but it can be done. You know, the biggest objection that I have to chemo is that it's all standardized in that you're going to have four cycles of this or six cycles of this or eight cycles of this, 12 cycles of this. And I've had so many patients that have had a complete response after one or two cycles right. and their medical oncologist is insisting that they finish the protocol and so by the time they get to the end of the protocol, now they have neuropathy, they have fatigue, you know, their mitochondria are shot. Mm -hmm. And we're not, we, we've completely abandoned individual personalized medicine. And that's my biggest objection. I don't have any problems with using the tools that we have for benefit. But I don't think that it's one size fits all. I don't think it should ever be one size fits all. And at the same time, you know, I have patients that have gotten three and four doses of chemo, have no response. And these doctors are keep going. What right. are we doing? Right. That's not working. 
I've seen that. Yes. Right. Right. Exactly. You're right. You have to go. We have to be more precise and we have to personalize and individualize everybody's treatment. So now are they doing that? My guess is because that's the standard they they're, they're told this is what they do. Mm -hmm. Right. And then they're worried if they don't do it, uh, they're liable or held responsible and or held accountable yes. by the AMA or whomever the governing bodies. Yes. A hundred percent. Except that we do as physicians have the right to use FDA approved drugs in the ways that we want to use it. Mm. Right. So we can use drugs off label. We, we are, we are allowed to do those things. Mm. What they fear is that because you didn't follow protocol that they are, you know, um, that they're going to be held liable. So I don't understand why we don't have a system where if a patient wants to opt out of the protocol, they can just sign a waiver and opt out of the protocol. Right. 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 And I don't, I don't think that certainly my patients are not going to be litigious with, with someone for not having given them more chemo, right? Like it, it just, to me, it's so crazy. And yet, you know, that's not how they're thinking. I mean, it's, it's cover your ass medicine that they're right. practicing and it has nothing to do with the person in front of them. And that's the shame of it right. that we've so lost sight of the person in front of us. Yeah, that's Very right. True. That's right. Very true. All right. One yep. Low dose uh, naltrexone, a good option to boost immunity or have properties that could prevent uh, BC breast okay. cancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I have, I, I'm going to a talk on low dose naltrexone. There's not that much data on low dose naltrexone and breast cancer, but here's where the data is really impressive to me. Low dose naltrexone is an immune modulator, and what it's able to do is help the immune system to reset. And so many women with breast cancer, I I see them when when they come into my practice, they have white counts in like the twos and threes and fours. And they they have, or or they're the other side of it and they have autoimmunity. So there is an inherent issue with the the, uh, immune system and so I have found it very beneficial because, you know, we're, we're not just treating women for breast cancer and breast cancer usually doesn't travel alone. There are a whole host of issues that our patients are coming to us with and we're treating their entire body. And part of that body is making sure that their immune system is intact. So I, I use low dose naltrexone almost universally. Uh, and I generally use the 4.5 milligram dose and I, I do pulse it. So I do three months on one month off and I have people take it in perpetuity. Right. We, we use yeah. it too. And it does, it's very effective for killing circulating tumor cells. So, yeah. uh, so it is a beneficial, it's been, it's a, it's substance been around for a very, very long time. Yes. And so has a very long history of efficacy and use. And, and it's extremely safe. Right. And I have not had a drug interaction issue with, with low dose naltrexone. I don't know if you guys have, but to date, I have not had any issues. Right. The only time is if someone were not, you would never give it with someone taking opioids, you know, right. so of course. that would be the only t- person. Yeah. We yeah. don't. I think there are some reports of um, elevated liver enzymes. And so I think I was told not to give it to anyone with liver mets, but I I haven't had any liver enzyme elevation in anyone. I, 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 in the beginning I was checking. um, And now I don't even check anymore because I just haven't seen it. Right. Yeah. I don't see it either. So. All right. All right. So 20 after we'll do one more. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. So there's so much conflicting information on diet with regards to healing from breast cancer. Dr. Simmons mentions plant, uh, mentioned plant-based low glycemic is juicing contrary to the low glycemic portion of this advice. 
much of the plant-based community sings the praises of carrot juice. Yeah, I'm not on the carrot juice bandwagon. Um, I, I, I think without question, we have enough evidence to know that cancer is a metabolic disease, that sugar is not good for cancer. Um, it causes elevations in blood glucose. It causes elevations in insulin. It causes elevations in insulin-like growth factor. And that is not what any person who is cancering needs. Um, I also don't love juicing because really, although yes, you are getting some of the vitamin content, uh, you're removing all of the fiber. And so you're really just bolusing the sugar. And I don't, I, I, I just don't think that's good for anyone. So I am not a fan of juicing. I know there are a lot of people out there who really believe in juicing. I do not. Uh, and what we have to remember is, you know, when we talk about not eating processed foods, when you juice or you put that food in a food processor, you're processing the food. I mean, you can call it minimally processing, but when you change the, when you change the arrangement of the molecules, you make that sugar readily available into the system and it's so easily absorbed and it will raise your blood glucose. So, you know, if that's something that you really want to do, I would wear a continuous glucose monitor and just watch what happens to you when you drink juices or smoothies or anything like that. Because I think that you'll be surprised in seeing that your body doesn't like it quite as much as you thought. Right. And the base, biggest thing is people need to examine what they're putting in their mouth because they're eating processed foods with added sugar, foods that have chemicals in them and just eat real food, yeah. you know, so. In their um, most natural form. In their, right? exactly. So if you want yes. to have some fruit or yeah, carrots. Fruits, I don't, yeah, fruits are fine, you know. You yeah, and I don't have anything against carrots, yeah. but I do have something against right. carrot juice. Right. I just well, I had a patient years I, ago who did do a carrot juice and they went into diabetic ranges doing carrot juice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so every doctor should be checking a patient's fasting glucose, mm -hmm. their insulin level and their hemoglobin A1C. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, that's and I, I, I think it's very unlikely that you're going to go get diabetes from eating too many carrots because right. you would get pretty full. Yes. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> exactly. The, the fiber slows the insulin release. So you get a yeah. very slow absorption yeah. as opposed to a shotgun effect. And uh, that's that's a big, that's just some metabolic, you know, blood sugar metabolism uh, 101. But that's what happens. You're basically just dumping sugar right in and there's not a slow absorption. It's very fast. So. It, yep. You know, if we're thinking metabolic, you know, we're using Dr. Seafried and and his 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 research, right? And we're slamming yep. and pressing that glucose. It might not yep. be nice. so. And so, he was he was just on my podcast uh, last week, the week before, something like that. So, um, if you want to hear more about that, just take a listen. Keeping abreast with Dr. Jen with Dr. Thomas Seafried. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. He's adamant. Yeah, we love him. He's, he's adamant, great. right? He's, yeah. Which is mm -hmm. great. He's in the research. He's very I love him. literate, yeah. as I he love said. Him. I do. Yeah. He's yeah. great. So. Um, all right. So should we close? So yeah, closing comments, Dr. Simmons. I I am very happy about your your um desire to transform the future of women and health care and humanity mm -hmm. in such a positive and in non-injurious, non-toxic, uh, non-harmful way. And, uh, you know, as you know, I've been doing this a long time and I need people. We all need to work together to do this. Yes. And so it's I, a movement. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's a, a movement. movement. It yeah. is a movement. And, you know, we all took an oath to first do no harm. We did that on our first day of medical school, and I am sticking by that. And women have suffered under some serious, serious harms in the conventional medical system. And I'm just on a mission to make sure that we stop hurting people and start helping them. 
because that's what being a healer is all about. Right. Well, thank you for being yeah. part of our cancer conversation. And, you know, I love doing things with you. And uh, um, and so we've got to just continue on. Right back at you. And um, I will send you a copy of my book. It will be oh, out in wonderful. two weeks. Yeah, oh, congrats, exciting. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. That's very good. Wonderful. All right. Well, Dr. Wendy, yeah. you want to close and talk yeah. about it? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things, uh, Dr. Simmons, that we've been working hard on in 2024, I mean, we've been working hard on this for a long, long time, time, but definitely wellness, the wellness concept, the preventative concept. So the, the concept of prevention is always easier than the cure, right? We all know that. So this is the part where, you know, get your screenings in, get your, we want to work on the body. We want to work on the cell. So you change the cellular environment. We do our immune boosting and we look at oxygen and alkalization of the cell. And then we want to charge the cell, but we have to, we have to test all that, right? And then we want to make sure that you're putting good things into your body and we're testing the, uh, the stress component, the cortisol, the hormone levels. We're looking at uh, your pathogens, right? These things that Dr. Simmons had talked about on that one slide was, was fantastic because that's the cause part. So even in today's world, I, I say this all the time, you know, very big on exercise my whole life, very big on clean eating, very big on the supplementation. It's not enough probably in today's world right. to stop there. You have to look at your exposure to EMS. You have to look at your toxins and chemical exposure, and you have to look at your, your pathogens, the Epstein-Barr viruses or your 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 bacteria loads, uh, your fungal loads, whether it's mycotoxins or candida overgrowth, parasites, Dr. Simmons mentioned parasites, they're huge these days. We see them constantly. So when we have all these, I call them fuels to the fire, initiating that inflammatory response, which then causes oxidative stress, right? That's where the damage comes in at the cellular level. So if we're, if we're able to identify the cell and the damage to the cell, but then work up and look at the fuels to the fire. Now we start winning the battle before it even becomes a battle. And so this wellness concept in, in 2024, we're pushing it hard. And what, what is, you said it today and we're seeing it. And Dr. Simmons, you probably see it. We're seeing younger and younger and more aggressive cancers come through the door and you know, we're, we're in a battle. And, right. and, and if we can get on the wellness side and this concept of going digging deeper early in the process, we have a great chance of preventing it from going any further or even becoming a, a disease. disease process. Right. Yeah, huge. for sure. It's huge. Um, sure. Not easy. I understand. Right. Yeah. Not easy because a lot of times we react when there's a crisis. Right. And so the wellness and this integrative early onset wellness screening process, I think is so significant. We just encourage it so much because we're in it. And Dr. Simmons, you probably will see the same thing. When you're in it every day, personally, it scares me straight. I do, I, I do the things. I walk the line. Walk the line. Right. Walk the line. Right. So um, if we could say anything to close, the conviction in the preventative part of this is huge these days. So we would advocate it, whether it's here, Dr. Simmons is in Philly, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, wherever you can do it, start going down that path of identifying. Yeah. Little by little, reading Dr. Simmons' book, my book, yeah. we, you've got to take inventory of yourself and change things before you hit a crisis. You know, a, for some reason, a crisis gets your attention, but you need to get your attention without a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's yeah. So much Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Like that's the world that I want to live in right. where it doesn't take a crisis to right. change, to, to, to walk the line. Right. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that things are getting better. I'm hopeful that people are saying no, making better decisions, you know, getting the plastics out of our lives and getting all the chemicals out of our lives and, 
or, or all that we can, making better choices at every step along the way, because that's what's going to make the difference is when we say no to industry, when we say no to the processed food and right. no to all the chemicals and, and no to the convenience and the commercialization that is killing us. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. Agree, agree. That's the movement, ladies and gentlemen. So, <laughs> so take charge of your health right. right now. That's right. Go get it. Go all get right. It. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Thank you, Thank Dr. Thank you for all having me. It was so wonderful. So great to see you. Yeah, great to I'll see look you up, too. I'll look you up in Philly uh, next time I'm in. Definitely. Right. Thank you Take for care, all buddy. of our army of people that you know really are involved in, in changing and transforming uh, the future of health and humanity. And so we want to thank all the people out there that are listening right yeah, now, yeah, listening later, because there's a lot of people that couldn't be on tonight that will listen later. And so they're part of this movement to help us. So thank you. Beautiful. Amazing. All right. Thank okay. You. Bye, y'all. Bye. Much Bye love. Be good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.